It was the day after Thanksgiving, and I had a lot to be thankful for. My youngest son had come to stay for the weekend. I took that Friday evening off work so we could spend some time together. He's always eager to play guitar. He was wanting to work together on a composition, and I was leaning more towards wanting to do an improvised jam, and I was able to convince him to do a Facebook Live improvised jam along with a drum beat that we had arranged on the computer. That was the evening of the 26th. It was viewed by at least one person, Fred Davis, who clicked like on it. The next day was Saturday the 27th. I downloaded the video from Facebook. I had to go into work that evening at 10 p.m. and I worked till 6.30 a.m. I'd work, since I'd worked all night, it turned out Eden had also stayed up all night, so on the 28th, which was a Sunday, we both slept in a bit. Then he had to go back to Tucker County so he could go to school the next day, and I drove back to Grafton and went into work at 10 p.m. that night, and I worked till 6.30 a.m. on the 29th of Monday, and that began my weekend. Once I began editing the video, I realized that there were some really good parts, but the sound overwhelmed the little microphone that was on my cell phone, and that's what we had used to record it. But I ran it through a noise gate, which is an effect available to me in the Magic Music Maker app. And once I did that, and I set the high thresholds and the low thresholds and extracted the sounds that were more or less noise, this greatly improved the sound quality. After hearing the finished product, I realized that my playing, even though I was improvising, I found the same groove that I'd stumbled on about eight months earlier when I recorded a YouTube video I titled The Road from Egypt. I was very excited to have made some music with my son. It had some parts that I felt bordered on magic. And it compelled me to attempt to want to set lyrics to it. I hand wrote 12 pages of lyrics in a notebook on six sheets of notebook paper front and back. Then I began typing it into my laptop using Microsoft Word. I made a lot of edits during this process and changed the lyrics quite a bit during that as well. The premise of the lyrics is that all humanity began in Egypt and spread out from there. It's told from the viewpoint of a caravan of people who are without a homeland, therefore they're faced with the treacherous task of crossing land where tribes of people have already staked their claim. The revised lyrics were completed and saved that evening of November the 30th. This was a Tuesday, and I still had a little more than 24 hours till I had to go to work on Wednesday the next night. So I began making an effort to vocalize the lyrics along with the music that Eden and I had recorded after many takes, I wasn't getting anywhere close to something that sounded like a finished recording. The jam that we recorded was raw and wild, and vocal melodies is a weak point for me anyhow. So I decided to use my Music Maker program to compose a rhythm track, and then just try and wrap the lyrics in. This was sounding better for sure, but I kept messing up the words, and making a take, and then deleting a take, and trying again and again, and it was getting more and more frustrating. This continued even as noon rolled around. Then I received a call from my daughter at 12.07 p.m. December the 1st. During that call, I was hearing instances of static each time that she'd finish a sentence and each time I'd finish a sentence. Just very brief, and I commented about it to her, but I wrote it off as a minor glitch on the service provider's end. Nonetheless, we talked for 52 minutes and 52 seconds. When I returned to my computer to resume attempting to make a recording, I was crushed to see that the file had been corrupted. The screen was so bizarrely scrambled that I knew something strange had happened. So I took a picture of the screen with my phone so I could begin documenting this matter. When I clicked on the screen, I received notification that the program had crashed and I was given an option to load the auto-saved file. 
this still should not have presented a problem because I'd been very careful to have already saved the complete lyrics the night before. But when I loaded the autosaved edition, I discovered the vast majority of the words were missing. I'd been working with various forms of Microsoft Word for more than 20 years, and I've learned to make sure to save all my changes. This caused a state of panic, and I assessed the matter, and the only logical conclusion seemed pretty outrageous. I'd been hacked and robbed of my creative property. This propelled me with a sense of urgency to hurry and get a recording completed so I could upload it and establish ownership. But the final edit was gone. So what I had was six sheets of front and back handwritten words. I decided I was going to have to do it all in one take and immediately upload it to Facebook to establish that timestamp. As I wrapped the words to a beat, I had to struggle to make out my handwriting so the words differ from what was on the paper. But I was pleased to have stayed with beat for the most part. And for the parts where I fell out of track with the words I was trying to read, I was able to freestyle them well enough that I didn't totally lose my place when I got to the scribble parts and the parts where the writing was just not very good. I hurried and uploaded the recording. I then received a far greater shock than just lyrics that had come up missing. Facebook reported back the message. More than nine minutes of my recording had been muted, saying that my recording may belong to someone else. This made absolutely no sense. And now I knew for sure that my creative property was in jeopardy. The rhythm track was a four measure drum beat that repeated for the duration, aside for a few measures that I overlapped due to being rushed were actually mistakes. The worst of the whole thing is the whole story sounds completely insane. Not only had my recording been mostly muted, I had been refused the opportunity to dispute it. And now, I just handed the full thing over to Facebook, or Meta, as I think it may be legally known as today. I'd never seen anything like this, and I was 100% sure that my work that I had done was in the process of being stolen. But then I hurried and rushed to upload it to YouTube so I could have some sort of timestamp on it, even though Meta's timestamp would be at an earlier time of the same day. Yet I had the words that were in my handwriting. And anyone who listens to the recording while looking at the words will know for sure that they are the words that I was attempting to rap. Because you'll be able to see when I come to the parts that are scribbled and written badly that that's where the delays are in the speech. Also, I had the recording made in my music making app, which I made short videos of and uploaded them to serve as some sort of evidence that I had not only written all the words, but also composed the music. I loaded these samples to Facebook, and Facebook didn't challenge those. Nonetheless, I knew that whatever hacker had been able to get into my computer, into both Microsoft Word, and then also to be able to disrupt my attempt to load it on a social media platform, had some serious tech savvy, and most likely financial capabilities to acquire legal representation, unlike myself. Worst of all, on my end, not only was I alone when all this happened, this whole thing sounded completely unreal to anybody I talked to about it. Not only did it sound unlikely to them, they were unable to relate to my frantic state of urgency as I tried to explain the matter. And I did try to explain it to everyone I talked to. I talked to somebody in the hopes of finding a witness that could take a look at my work and see what I was being robbed of and understand that I was being robbed by Facebook. Facebook was accusing me of having stolen the work I was trying to upload and not even giving me the opportunity to dispute it, and now they had it in their possession. So, yes, the worry was on the level of frantic, not only because this, of this one recording, but also knew that if they could take away something that I had handwritten evidence of and the sound of my own voice, then they could certainly steal the stuff that I had typed into the computer, thousands of pages of stuff that's unpublished, that nobody's read a lot of it, and they're in the digital format. Nonetheless, I don't make money off my music, not even some of what the small investment I put into the apps I use to create it. And come 10 p.m., 
On December the 1st, it was time for me to begin my work week on that Wednesday night. Throughout the week, I continued working with my recordings, adding effects and more instruments toward trying to make a truly professional sounding finished product. Facing this fierce, invisible adversary brought out the most of my efforts, and it also compelled me to write a Facebook post using the analogy of a canary in a coal mine. Part 2. The Canary in the Coal Mine. On December 2nd, the next day after this theft and this accusation of plagiarism had taken place, I made this post to Facebook. I've never been in a coal mine, and I don't even actually know what a canary looks like. But yet I feel bad for a canary in a coal mine. I imagine he doesn't get a whole lot of appreciation. He's probably discontent and has big dreams about flying in the open air. People probably don't enjoy having to deal with this shit. Now, I'm talking about literal shit, you know, bird shit. You gotta clean the cage and all, you know, but... And the only contribution he makes, really, is when he dies. And only then do people realize that they're in real danger. Because the real nuisance is a silent, undetected killer. And as long as the canary is around, they can mine. And I wonder if things would be different if the canary was able to speak and be understood about the methane, because I figure he'd like to make it out of that shaft too. Since it's just a what-if scenario, though, I suppose I have to imagine that the methane's able to speak also. He'd probably mainly cast a whole lot of shade on the canary. Now, on second thought, he'd probably be more likely to just do things to agitate the canary, so he'd be even more annoying while continuing to be undetected and not even there, as far as everyone else is concerned. Well, I was happy to see that that post did get a response from Justin Davis, and that Justin Davis is a smart guy and also a you know, kind-hearted guy. Not only did he respond with a comment, he included a link to a picture and a link to an article. The picture depicted a canary resuscitator, which is used to revive canaries that pass out due to carbon monoxide. But when I read the article, I noticed that it was talking about a particular accident where a John Haldine was asked to help to determine an explosion in 1896. And he concluded the explosion was caused to a buildup of carbon monoxide. And he set out to find a way of detecting that odorless gas that could be harmful to humans. And that's how the canary came to be captive. I was grateful to have a comment at all, honestly. But I had to point out, you know, that I had talked about methane and he's talking about carbon monoxide. So I just had to say this, Justin Davis, not that it relates at all to the point, but just to keep with the science things correct. And then I included a link to methane gas. And that link explains that methane gas is what actually explodes in the mines. Justin Davis replied, Robert Allen Burton, that's noteworthy that the science article got that wrong. I thought it was the same one I'd recently read. I should check next time. Well, I read that as a sincere compliment, and I responded, Justin Davis, I haven't been a miner, but I have dug trenches. You have to keep in mind, some people go to school for four years, and they have the power of a degree forever. Some people study their entire life, not for a degree, but for actual functioning knowledge, so they can do what they need to do when it's time to do it. And that's how things conclude on December 2nd. Now, meanwhile, all this time, I'm still working on that composition of what had come to be known as Crossing Judah. Then on September 3rd, when I look back to see if anybody else had responded, I see one comment that's since been deleted. And it was by someone saying that they're Bonnie Heckler, who simply said, over my head. Well, at first I made a comment asking what's over her head, and there was no response to that. So I scanned back through it all, and I realized that I think I may have uh, read Justin's statement wrong the first time. I think the way he actually meant it was Robert Allen Burton. That's noteworthy that the science article got that wrong. And I thought it was the same one I had read recently. I should check next time. Ooh, yeah. So this response with the first part of it by me, the thanks for the heads up, was actually intended for Bonnie Heckler, who was the one that cued me that maybe something had went over my head and I had to go back and read it. That's when I wrote, I'd been so focused on other things this morning that I didn't recognize the passive-aggressive sarcasm of Justin Davis. Good stuff, Justin. Misplaced, however. 
A quick search of whether or not carbon monoxide explodes came up with 7,520,000 results, and this is the first one of those. A carbon monoxide leak is very unlikely to explode. While theoretically it's possible that it could build up in an enclosed space without catching fire, the odds are overwhelmingly in favor of it catching fire long before it explodes. Then I presented once again the methane gas, which it only takes a small amount, 5 to 15 percent of the air only needs to be methane before it explodes. Then I went on to state, mass amounts of carbon monoxide are put off as a result of any explosion. And so when an investigation crew would test the air levels following an explosion, you would definitely find the carbon monoxide levels at first to be high. But carbon monoxide is an unstable gas meaning that it rarely stays in that form for very long. Carbon monoxide typically pairs with an oxygen molecule and becomes carbon dioxide, which is why it is so dangerous in regards to asphyxiation, because it actually takes oxygen out of the air. But the bird and the miners would be dead of asphyxiation long before you would reach that explosive level. Now, in the case of a methane explosion, which is what I was referring to, that resuscitator, our poor little canary will be cooked inside it as a result of the explosion. So thank you, Justin Davis, for trying to set my mind at ease, but at least we can be sad together about it now. But then I decided, you know, I probably better just uh, clear things up. And I stated this post was a metaphor about freedom of speech, by the way. A lot of unpopular voices, yet relevant and important for rare but crucial situations, are silenced first. And people are often happy about it. But as long as you hear those unpopular voices, then you can feel safe because unpopular means that they are unpopular on both sides of the fence. It doesn't mean that that person is right, but it does mean that freedom of speech is in place. And therefore, those types of people serve as an early detection system of sorts. But why am I now talking about freedom of speech rather than theft of copyrights? I would long felt that Facebook had pigeonholed me as a social disruptor, and they were suppressing the amount of views that my posts were getting. But now that Facebook had literally falsely accused me of plagiarism, I had every reason to suspect the worst case scenario. That Facebook, or Meta, whatever its name is, they're already beginning to apply the China model of internet control. Going so far as to not only give my posts limited views, but also arranging for posts to be viewed by people who are most likely to disagree. What bothered me most was the fact that they were not only trying to suppress my artwork and my opinions, they were suppressing evidence that I am also a loving father. To illustrate this point, I presented two pictures. Both of these pictures I posted in the last couple of months. One of them was of me and a pal that none of my Facebook friends have ever met drinking a beer on a porch, and it got 21 likes. The other one was of me and all three of my children, and the caption explained that it was the first time we'd all been able to get together in over a year, and it was our big family outing to the state capital of Charleston, West Virginia. This picture got 10 likes. The whole lack of love I was getting from my Facebook friends defied logic and reason. So my post presenting these pictures say, I will believe that I'm the one with the problem, if anyone can explain to me this. Well... Of my Facebook friends, a guy named Phil Brown said, Facebook does not promote family life, and more people like beer than people that know your children. But a year ago, a picture of me and any of my kids got 20 likes. So I don't think that that's what the case was. And I actually understand a little bit about how the algorithms of Facebook work. They actually promote family life if they're in favor of the person, if they're neutral about the person. But with me... The picture of me and all three of my kids got not half of what me drinking a beer got. So I started mentioning my friends in the comments. By mentioning their names, I would bring their attention to this. One by one, I called them in, but it got very little response. My most liked public post was when I went to work at the hospital. And I believe that it is by and large my opinions about the injustice of freedoms being taken away in response to the coronavirus that has brought me into the crosshairs of these invisible oppressors, the methane gas as it is, that knows that I write and paint, and I embed my opinions within all of that. No one responded to my request for a screenshot of what was transpiring on Facebook. I was seriously questioning whether or not they and I were seeing the same things. One humorous post that popped up in my newsfeed that somebody posted on their own page 
said, It's all fun and games until Santa Claus goes down his naughty and nice list. Whether or not it was intentionally meant for me, I suspect it was, but even if it wasn't, it spoke a little bit of humor and comfort. I did get this DM from a girl I hadn't seen since high school, Bonnie Heckler, the same girl who had said over my head a few days earlier. She asked for my number, and the call went like this. I say, hello? She says, hey, how are you? I said, good, I'm okay, how are you? She said, I want to talk to you about uh, some of the strange things that are going on. Do you have a special phone that you can talk on? I say, no, this is only one. She says, so where are you living at now? I answer, Grafton. She says, Grafton, where exactly is that? Now, this struck me as weird because I thought anyone who's lived in Tucker County knows where Grafton is. But I said, Grafton, West Virginia. Now, it's been way too long since I've talked to her to know whether or not I could recognize her voice or not. Then she said, well, I'm just staying at my mom's old house in Hamilton. I can't go anywhere right now. Uh, bad transmission. But she repeated, bad transmission. I didn't really have a response except, hmm. So she continued. So anyway, I hear you've been writing books. I said, oh yeah, I have a couple that are self-published. They haven't really sold much, but I keep busy. She asked, well, what's the title of the most recent one? I kind of stumbled with the title because it's so long. I said, a long way home, and then I was trying to remember the second part, and I know this probably sounded like I was lying, and then that made me a little bit embarrassed. Through the embarrassment of trying to remember the title, I totally forgot that she appeared in the book, even though I'd spoken about it to Burkhammer in messages right before this call. Her name is Molly Vexer in the book. She continued, and I hear you drew some kind of diagram. I wasn't actually sure what she was referring to at that point. Then she said, so what's going on down there with the Jehovah Witnesses? Even though I had no idea what she was talking about, this actually made the whole thing more convincing because from the little I remembered about her, she seemed to be the type that would concern herself with local neighborhood stuff more than thoughts about global conflicts. But I replied honestly, I don't know, is there something going on with the Jehovah Witnesses? She said, oh, I thought you said something about the Jehovah Witnesses. Hmm. I just thought maybe you knew. I said, no, I don't know anything about the Jehovah Witnesses. She said, oh, well, these Muslims sure are doing crazy things, aren't they? The Muslims, I said. I knew I hadn't said anything about the Muslims. Then I took the initiative to ask her a question. Do you remember the names of any elementary school teachers we had at Hamrick? She paused and said, no, no, not really. And I hung up immediately because that was simply impossible. And suddenly I realized the whole thing was way out of whack. I immediately went to my friends list to delete her name. That's what I noticed. There were two Bonnie Hecklers. One of them was the real girl I knew and the other I believe was most certainly an imposter. What a fool I've been. I thought about it and realized how blatantly easy it would be to clip someone's picture then copy their public profile information, and then start sending friend requests to their friends. Now, as I started deleting names, I saw again and again how many of them were double profiles, two of most of the people on my friend list, and especially the ones that shared my opinions of standing up for liberty. Nonetheless, since I didn't have a way to sort out which ones are real, I just started deleting them all until I had no Facebook friends. At work that night, I talked to a worker who was a Facebook friend, and I mentioned him in my comments. And he said that he hadn't seen a notification. I showed him the screenshot, and he's like, you really did mention me. I knew for certain one thing I had to do was connect with people who truly know me in person and as soon as possible. Who's to say there wasn't already a fake me on Facebook saying and doing God only knows what in my name? To me, at this point, the most important thing was the song I'd recorded and was continually editing throughout the week. I had written it. It was my thoughts, but the series of events involved that led up to the intense and dramatic one-take recording had caused a sort of shuffling of the deck in the words that were freestyled and certain sounds that my microphone picked up, such as a car that streaked by at a crucial moment in the psalm, made it feel to me that God had joined in and was giving me heavenly aid. At one point, it was me speaking the psalm. Now the psalm was speaking to me. I talked to Isaac Reyna and Bob Burkhammer, but I felt an intense need to have eyewitnesses. After the Molly Bexer call, I could feel them coming for me. Yes, them in that broad, undefined sense that gets people put in straitjackets. But I had some proof that I could show, and I felt that if I could just show it to someone, I could get them to understand that they needed to rally help from me, or else... This song will most certainly be the first domino that would topple every single work of art 
I'd ever done, and even more importantly, the far greater accomplishments I've aspired toward my entire life. I had a sense of who was coming for me and why, and I probably should have remained quiet about that then, but I didn't, at least not to Burkhammer and Isaac. I talked about not only my theories, but even presented some whimsical postulates, and thus muddied the water. That's why, with this present production, I'm sticking strictly to the facts, like a dead man's last pistol shot. This must travel far, straight, and fast. So I must now jump to Monday, December 6. The recording was sounding great to me. Great enough I felt that it could do a lot of talking for me. I'd shown it to a couple people at work, but I couldn't present this 11-minute song without expressing that it was crucial for them to hear it. And I couldn't express that it was crucial without explaining that Microsoft and Facebook were willing participants in this theft. Ultimately, it was just one guy watched the entire thing, and he said he loves conspiracy theories, which is great and all, but I needed the aid of people who could just be like, holy shit, they can't do this to you, and rally some support for me. That simply couldn't happen here where no one really knows me, and nobody has known me for more than a couple years, and there is more likely far more misinformed rumors and speculations about me than there is first-hand knowledge. At the same time, I don't know these people that well either, and I felt that a couple, even several, are a potential part of the methane out to silence the canary. So without telling a soul, I kept a plot sealed up in my mind to rush toward Bob Burkhammer just as soon as I left work on December 6th. I drove like a bat out of hell and fully expecting that I might be being pursued en route to Burkhammer's. I played Crossing Judah as I fled, indeed a gypsy on the run, coming, coming, coming to present this song to an age-old friend, straight from the app I used to create it, so he could know for sure and see and be my rock-solid witness. I hoped that I could compel him to ride with me to Kate's house and help me convince her to stream it live on her Facebook straight from my app so there could be a thousand witnesses that I was being wrongly accused of plagiarism by Facebook. I made it there safe and sound and he was home luckily. He let me in and I wasted no time in getting right to it and we sat down. My battery on my computer was nearly dead and I knew I was going to have to show at least one more viewing so it could be recorded with a phone. I knew I couldn't be the one to convince Kate to do it. It would have to be Burkhammer. But first, I had to convince Burkhammer, which I expected was a given. But he said, what do you want me to do? As if I was asking him for a kidney. I said, will you record it with your phone so there can be some proof that I created it? And then what, you want me to post it to Facebook? I don't post stuff like that on Facebook. I said, well, can you just at least record it? He said, no. He said, why do you want me to have it so you can just come back and get it? I said, yeah, maybe, if it happens I need the proof at some point. No, he said. I said, you can't do that? He said, no, God. You need an agent, not me. That's what you need. An agent, I thought to myself. Agents are possibly monitoring me. They're sure as hell not looking to promote my talents. I said, Bob, will you please do this for me? I'll give you $20. No, he said, I don't want your money. I said, Really, you won't do this for me? No, he declared as he stood up from his couch angrily. I said, well, that's fucked up. In a flat, disheartened plea for mercy, you're fucked up, he said. You need, I don't even know what you need. And he began walking upstairs, and I headed out the door. I knew I couldn't hope to get Kate to record it, but I decided to get a memory stick so I could transfer a copy to that and hopefully have her give it to Eden. I stopped at the dollar store and got memory sticks and transferred one of the files on the way to her place. When I knocked on the door, she answered, all huffy and puffy, with an answer of no before I asked a question. I said, I just need you to give this to Eden. No, she said, and if you don't leave, I'm going to call the cops. Go back to Burkhammer's. Fucking Burkhammer. That was the last place I wanted to go. He'd help persuade Kate, all right, the opposite way of the way I'd hoped. I made another copy in her driveway before she came out and chased me away. On my way back to Grafton, I thought more about Burkhammer's reaction. Why, so you can come back to get it, he'd said. And I thought about that St. Paul Chronicles, which I did come back and request the handwritten letters so I could type them into the computer. When I got home, laying out was a copy of The Long Way Home. 
and I reread St. Paul Chronicles at the end of the book. Bonnie Heckler appears in the book as Molly Vexer, only in those handwritten letters that Burkhammer possessed did she appear in her real name. Burkhammer had been compromised, and somebody had thought that there was some ammo against me with that name, Bonnie Heckler, some deep secret about a girl I barely knew. But yes, in the second grade, I had a fantasy crush. Now to the morning of December 7th. As I worked on my computer through the night, I made further revisions of the song, giving it a secret name and hiding it in secret files. I suddenly started seeing files disappear. Then an assortment of files popped up that said public. In Google, I was informed that someone was logged in in my name. I was watching my life's work disappear before my eyes. I screenshotted as much as I could. When I knew that Isaac was going to be home, I headed to his place. Unlike Burkhammer, he obliged me and recorded Crossing Judah from the app. He wasn't up in arms for me, and he was somewhat doubtful, but very decent to me. As I was driving back to Grafton, he called and said I could come back, and he apologized for saying he needed me to leave because he mistakenly thought that the landlady had pulled up. I began to thank him and tell him how much better he treated me than anyone else, and then click the call terminated. So here you see this pistol shot. If it hit the mark, that pinhole was in the dam. 